Yes. Excellent. Okay. Thank you very much. No worries. Right, I'll set my timer. So thanks, thanks for coming. Um, Ian, let me start an ophthalmologist in NHS Forth Valley and what well, the Scottish Government is National Teleophthalmology League. Um, ophthalmology um, is particularly uh, at risk of all the, all the um, things that make COVID a particular problem. Close examination distance, elderly patient, crowded places. The first uh, doctor to get COVID-19 was a, a Chinese ophthalmologist during COVID surgery. Um, so the pressure's on to, to find alternatives to this type of antiquated examination where you're about inch away from the patient. Um, so this talks really past pandemic and future and uh, since about 2017 we were using a setup like this where we started off with an iPad basically tethered to a microscope with the optic which would have been around about here in the top left lined up with the ocular of the microscope and you've got a really high fidelity high resolution image which you could then start near me consultation or use the Skype for business when it started um, and it enabled a really unusual type of consultation where you've got a three-way conversation in this case between the emergency department nurse the patient um, and the ophthalmologist who's at a remote site and everybody seems to know who you're talking to at what moment so when i say look up look left the patient responds when i say can we put in a drop of fluorescein the nurse will respond and uh, it was quite quickly uh, very clear that it was a nice way to work we kind of brought this out because we thought we would know when to run to the department uh, to the ed but in actual fact we realized we could de-escalate the vast majority of what's been sent to us um this work is all very collaborative I should have said in my first slide and a large amount of this work leads from the university of strathclyde in mario giardini's lab so uh, the kind of patient journey if you like in this case to distill what, what we've been doing is um, the emergency department nurse will look at the patient might see something that they're not entirely happy with in this case we'll say it's a, a corneal metallic foreign body and um, the difference is I might be able to twist the nurse's arm to do something she wouldn't normally do which might be take a needle to that take it off which I could supervise and that would obviate a transfer from the patient to the eye unit um, and get things fixed at the point of presentation um, and we the actual journey to getting this little gadget um, out there was um, not straightforward it started off very much Fred in a shed uh, making it on a 3d printer and uh, just having something workable and then asking for forgiveness because we didn't have the right governance and everything around it and then a bit of effort and resource being put behind it uh, and we're very grateful to the technology and the care team to make a much more formal version of it um, and then COVID landed. So we're in this position where we're doing remote examinations anyway, because in of itself it was useful, but suddenly there's this increased pressure to increase uh, distance from patient and doctor. And by having a virtual uh, or a uh, digital viewfinder, you're suddenly increasing the distance from patient to doctor by about threefold. And it's a breath guard of sorts uh, in the form of a wipeable tablet. And it also lended itself well to other pieces of work that we're doing to try and replace that direct ophthalmoscope where you're an inch away from the patient with something that's smartphone based and allowed an arm's length examination. Um, and then really just to, to give you an idea of the type of referrals that we're receiving, this is a very first call from the emergency department. This is a corneal form body that's in a corneal abrasion that's staining with, uh, with fluorescein. This is a penetrating trauma and actually they could just as easily point their iPads at the pack screen and I could see that this was an intra-globe foreign body which was sent to Glasgow and removed. And in this example, I was in the middle of a clinic, I could see that this needed surgery, I could plan the surgery, I could legitimately say to the anaesthetist that it needed fixed and I'd seen the patient and everything moved faster. And here I took a screen grab attached it to an email and from a registered device, nhs.net, nhs.net, and asked for it to be put in the case notes. And that's a pretty clunky workaround, but it was um, but it was an expedient way to get a very important medical legal picture 
into the documents uh, from these types of industrial accident, accidents. And again, it starts with a hack and then it gets a bit of resource behind it. And now we're moving towards having a, a real formal structure that can be disseminated to others across Scotland and beyond. So in COVID-19, we did something a bit different. So we knew it was working well with the emergency guys giving us a call, but now all optometry was closed. Um, there was a lockdown, uh, people were scared. We had to limit travel. We had to limit contact with hospital eye services where we possibly could. And we very quickly started activating optometrists, one per 100,000 across Scotland. And we uh, picked optometrists that had the highest skill sets they could prescribe and they had the equipment that we required. We could have OCT scanning facilities uh, and we made sure that there were telemedicine enabled, certainly for the units that I was involved in. So Grampian, Highland, uh, Western Isles, Forth Valley, all used the same model, which leaned on that ability to have a video call through the slip lamp. And it was an absolute delight to see these little notifications come through from all over Scotland every time somebody was making one of these teleophthalmology calls. And I could very quickly uh, see how much traction it was getting. And just to give you an idea of how much better it was when an optometrist was at the hill, these guys know how to drive a slip map. If there's a feature that they're not sure of, they show you precisely that. And being that second guy to dip into that consultation, give them a steer, maybe adjust the treatment plan, um, was very quick. And as well as just having a view through the slit lamp, as we can see here, they would use the same slit lamp computer to look at their OCT scans at the back of the eye. These are files, volume scans that would be gigabytes that are possible to send. Um, we could have all these appear as little selectable tabs. Um, and it was, you know, for new presentations of macular degeneration, retinal detachments, other sight threatening problems, vascular occlusions, all of it could be diagnosed remotely. And there was, to my mind, very little lost in the gap between us not physically being there. Um, so that's kind of how it rolls. We started off with high street optometry, hospital emergency departments, beaming all their digital media to us to allow us uh, to properly, it's a bit retro in many ways, you were a proper consultant and you were being consulted, giving advice, as opposed to the usual first on consultant uh, grind. And we've just recently started using it uh, because our medical students can't come in the same way um, and our medical students attached to us in in Fourth Valley is presently self-isolating because her friend tested positive for COVID, but it's not stopped her teaching. In the same way, the optons beam to us we have all the same facilities and we beam to either an individual medical student or an entire team or a group. And so that's been a real thrill to be able to teach in a new way. And the feedback from that way of working has been good because we're looking at an entire cohort of medical students that have missed their eye teaching. And when this landed, we, we fabricated as much as we could. We, we kind of cut through a lot of what would have been traditional regulatory steps. We provided the CAD files to optometrists all over Scotland, two of their own volition, managed to find the means to have them fabricated, to tell them to iPads and slip lamps themselves and get operational in record time. Uh, and we came across this gadget, which uh, was designed for something completely different. It was designed for attaching smartphones to telescopes, um, but it worked an absolute beauty because it had this unique feature of being able to adjust the Z distance, the distance of the optic away from the ocular, such that all the focal lengths worked. And with that, anyone with a smartphone with a decent signal, including average 4G, could get operational and we could be dialed into their practice and we get these really high fidelity anterior segment or posterior segment images. And the biggest efficiency is for retinal detachments. These patients, I think, are a bit disenfranchised, especially if they rock up at a district general hospital. It wouldn't be unusual for a retina to detach. Let's say it's on a Thursday, they get put into the next available emergency slot at a DGH on a Friday afternoon. We confirm what the optometrist thought it was, which is a retinal detachment. We have a phone call via our team in the tertiary centre, in our case, we felt in Glasgow, and the patient's lucky to be on the list on Monday, three days later. But with this, patient can go to their high street optometrist. We can see the detachment temporarily here. We can see it in beautiful detail in this OCT with all this fluid under the retina. And I can invite 
VR surgeon into the video call through near me by just add to call. You can see the visual fields, you can see the retina, and then he discussed directly with the patient, the type of anesthetic would they like, he debriefed to the optometrist, and the whole thing is done inside about 10 minutes. Journey safe from the patient, uh, but you know, while we recognize that um, there's been people kept at arm's length from service and conditions have been seen much later with worse outcomes, we had this stonk in new efficiency um, when it came to retinal detachments. That's, and while this conference is called No Going Back, the reality is these things are quite flimsy pegs. Uh, and when the funding for the acute eye centre stopped, um, these efficiencies actually quite quickly dried up and had to work hard to try and uh, keep some semblance of, of a continued teleophthalmology effort, particularly in units outside Fort Valley. Uh, who haven't been doing it for as long. So this is the traditional journey for your retinal detachment patient. So patient presents, uh, Optom will call us in secondary care, one of the triage nurses will put them onto a clinic, we have a look. Now, a lot of, some detachments will be because there's a tumour behind there or there's some inflammatory process and it'll be managed medically. So the VR surgeons in Glasgow can physically see every detachment that comes in. So there is a filter required, and that filter can be a remote exam. It doesn't have to be in person at the GH. Um, and the new, as was obvious from the video, the new pathway allows all these different media to be shared. We've got uh, two consultant ophthalmologists, optometrists, and the imaging for the patient there, and it goes straight to the VR team. And what I was really thrilled about is all of them were, were, were dealt with and really rapidly, with the best one being just over three hours, uh, being operated on in another board, having met the VR surgeon remotely in just over three hours previous. Um, and so we were doing these remote consultations before, and about 64% of cases it was felt received a physical appointment. And although it only took us five minutes, most of the time to be the second guy to dip in, being present in an unscheduled way was really challenging. And it's very hard to uh, capture that and set a consultant job plan in a meaningful and sustainable way. But after lockdown, no, it went up to 86%. So that's the percentage of cases where the ophthalmologist receiving the call felt that it completely obviated at least one secondary care appointment. And that difference pre and post lockdown with the activation of the EETCs, the sort of teleophthalmic units, um, was statistically significant. Um, and the indices of, of satisfaction were really high, universally high for, for uh, patients, optometrists, and ophthalmologists alike. And as I say, the vast majority of times you're just dipping in for uh, less than five minutes. So the way we approached it is we made on-site SPA sessions interruptible and added up typical amount of time you spent getting interrupted and then reimbursed that as admin time into the consulting job plan. Um, and so I've showed you a slide like this before, I particularly like this one because it just demonstrates how this turn of the century technology uh, has not changed and you can smell what you know, your patients had for lunch and them you uh, and it's just generally not ideal for COVID so this was a piece of work that uh, we developed with the University of Strathclyde and the uh, medical device unit in Glasgow and it builds on work where we made retinal adapters for low and middle income settings um, and it, it's a pretty, I think important innovation because um, there are two barriers to picking up an ophthalmoscope or guessing stick, as, as I've heard my neurologist pal call it. And one is it's difficult to get that picture. And the second thing is, even if you can see it, you're not sure what you're looking at. If you make it digital, you can get it more easily and you can cascade it for a second opinion more easily. So we've got this in the emergency department in the Queen Elizabeth and also in Fourth Valley. And it's not the only digital retinal imager out there. This is my main emergency department, uh, Ian Tuck, he's a consultant there. He's pointing this probe at his own eye, and I can see this wide field, really great uh, retinal image, and two very excited ophthalmologists, uh, not able to contain how satisfied they are to see that. But what that technology gives you is that there you've got a clinician that's not used to getting that type of view, can cascade it to us, and in the same way, we got retinal detachments straight from the optometrist to the VR surgeons, we can do the same out of hours 
uh, with technology like that and create the capacity to capture these type of referrals. But the biggest triumph, that watch my time, is when the patient uh, doesn't leave their, their home at all. I got a photograph during lockdown, looked a bit like this. They were worried it could be a conjunctivitis, could be a COVID conjunctivitis, should we bring it in, should we not? So we did a near knee call. And it became quite clear as the camera zoomed out, his eyes were pointing in different directions. And his right pupil was dilated compared to the left. It's got, if you put your mind to it, you can see it's bulging out slightly. And his son happened to have a torch on him. It's very obvious that, that right pupil just wasn't dilating properly. So although I would like to look at the disc, I'd like to know more information, I can see that this is a surgical orbit. And this guy went from his couch to the CT scanner without seeing an optometrist, without seeing an ophthalmologist, and went to the neurosurgeons the same evening for surgery on a leaking uh, carotid cavernous kind of sinus fistula. Um, but while I said it would be nice to have vision, we actually did point them towards an acuity app, and this is peak acuity, which is used throughout schools, uh, schools in Botswana as part of a government-led screening program, uh, also used across the Rift Valley in Kenya, but available on the Android app store for free. And I pointed it to that, and uh, this is a son holding up there. I could supervise the test being done, and I could satisfy myself uh, what the vision was in China. And that's good, but it could be better. And there's a particular need for vision tests uh, in people's own home just now, especially for children. Uh, kids wearing patches need to get checked. Uh, if you've got patching because one of the eyes are weaker, if you over or under patch, you damage the visual system system and this is the child my child's letter to say that there's school screening which Scotland does really well was completely cancelled so we're looking at a missed generation of screen children I'm not saying we replace a screening program but for those kids that are getting patched we can check their vision at home uh, with technology um, and that is the substrate of an SBRI project that we're progressing just now um, we made a little prototype. So through NHS and you and me, we share our screen as a sizing step with a credit card. And then as is shown in this video, I can check a child's vision. This child's in Birmingham uh, during lockdown. He's wearing a school uniform of habit. The schools have been closed for some time. Uh, and I can select which letter to show him and I can select which size to show it at. And here's his younger uh, child with uh, an optotype test. And the difference is, I can see if the eye's not being covered. I can see him sitting on mum's knee. I can see if he's leaning forward and cheating. And I can be much more confident in the result because it's become a supervised live test, not just somebody playing with an app uh, with 